This morning I've entitled my message, Three Roots of Loving the World, and I'd ask you to join with me in the book of Second of First John chapter 2. By the way, as you're turning there, I'll say that it has been a constant struggle of mine in this series not to say Second John every time I speak from First John chapter 2. It's just that the numbers want to get backwards in my mind. Today, I was looking up this passage in my Bible app, and I clicked on Second John. Well, how many chapters does Second John have? One. And so when I clicked on Second John, I'm like, well, where are chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5? And then I realized, oh, I'm in Second John, not First John chapter 2. So I would ask you to turn with me to the book of First John chapter 2. As you're turning there, we'll just reflect momentarily on what we've been considering over the past few weeks together. Just to summarize, you and I are all sinners. Though we are saved, though we are forgiven, as we emphasized last week, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. We continue to struggle with our sins and our sinfulness all through our lives, even after salvation because we possess the nature of the flesh. And as long as we possess that nature, we still struggle with sin. But, praise God, we learn that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. We have a propitiation, that is to say, a mercy seat, something that stands between us in mercy, between the guilt of our sin and God who is holy, and this Propitiation is Jesus Christ the righteous. Because of that, God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We looked at the exhortation to love one another as brethren, the new commandment that is not a new commandment, but is at one point new in the way that it was framed to us, to love one another, and by that all men know that we're His disciples. And then last week we learned that there are three different groups of people, as it were, in this we that we think about as the assembly of the Lord Jesus Christ. The we, the us, the people that gather in worship. There are, as we shared with you, little children. There are young men, young people, those of youth And there are the fathers, those that are older, those that have more experience. And as we shared with you last week, this could be, in two different senses, he could be referring to chronological age. You look around our congregation today, and what do you see? Because I believe God has blessed our church to be healthy, you see little children. And we love the little children. Without little children, we don't have a future generation in our church, to preach the gospel to. There's nobody to pass the torch to if we don't have younger people in our assembly, which is why we should take care of them and love them and, and treasure them and support them rather than being the stereotypical complainer about children and all the things that come with children. We should appreciate the fact that they're here because that gives us another generation to pass the gospel to in our location. We have young men here today, young women here today, we have youth here today, and we have fathers here today, those who are of age. But as we emphasized last week, that could also have reference to our endurance in the faith, as it were, how long you've been a person who's a follower of Christ. You might be more of a babe in Christ. You might be someone who recently began trying to serve Him with your life. You may be someone who has been following Him but a short period of time, but you have the strength of youth and the zeal of your first love, or you might be someone who has been serving the Lord Jesus Christ a long time, and you have great experience. And we need all three of these demographics in the church, either in terms of chronology or in terms of walking with Christ in the faith. We need new people. We need zealous people, and we need those with the wisdom that comes with years. Now, in today's message, we consider a passage in which John 
gives one of his more notable exhortations and admonitions that you'll find in the book of First John. To love not the world. What does it mean to love not the world? That's an interesting statement that captures our attention right there. Does that mean that I need to look out at this beautiful creation today and hate what I see? Well, depending on your circumstance, that might be the condition with you. Years ago, my grandfather lived across the street. He had a beautiful hill across the street that he could have bought several times, and he never did. That land was for sale. Someone bought it and decided that they were going to effectively put several things there. It looked like a makeshift junkyard. At one point, someone drove their car, driving probably intoxicated, through the fence, and she wouldn't let him come get it without paying to repair the fence. So now there was a wrecked car across the street from him. It was a red Dodge Neon. It wasn't even a cool car. Vines and weeds began to grow over it. She had several malnourished horses that she kept. And with the horses came the odor of horses. And again, her home was one step above disrepair. Every time he looked out his window, he hated what he saw. But if you look out the window today, you probably like the view that you see, don't you? It's a beautiful view. You look out the window and there's a, a nicely renovated school. You look out that way and there's a, our play set beyond it or dogwoods. And beyond that, you see the ball field there. Some of you probably really love looking at ball fields. That's never been something that I greatly care about. But you look out just initially right up close and you see the green, you see the sunlight. Is John telling us that when you look out at this creation that you need to think, I really hate those trees. Sometimes when I look out in my backyard, I don't like what I see because of the dog that lives back there. Y'all know that's a constant running cartoon sort of thing in my life, right? John, I don't believe, as we will come to in a moment, is telling us that we need to despise what we see in creation. But I believe John has something very specific in mind that he's telling us not to love. And included with this exhortation not to love the world is a reminder for us as we will see today, that this place is not our permanent home. We'll not be here forever. Now, even the secularists would have to admit that. We made the point today on the radio program that there's a completely different set of human beings on the planet than were 150 years ago. And there will be a completely new set of human beings on the planet 150 years from now, unless they invent some way to reverse aging and undamage our cells and bring back the life expectancy that we had prior to the, the flood of Noah, but I don't see that happening anytime soon. And even then, all human beings will face their death at some point in their life because, as the hymn writer said, we are born to die, to lay this body down. The wages of sin is death. We will all die because we are all sinners. But beyond the morbid, disappointing, depressing view of the atheist or the agnostic where we live and we eat and we drink and we be merry for tomorrow we die, you and I have a hope in glory that ought to reframe the way that we understand everything that we see in this world today, knowing that it's all temporary and there is a permanent world that is coming one day where we will be forever. That's one of the thoughts that we will consider today as well. Love not this world, specifically some things in this world, because you and I hope to be with Him one day in a place that is far better than this world. Let's read 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 through 17. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. 
and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Love not the world. All that is in the world, the world passeth away. You know, just reading those two statements in succession without the other remarks, love not the world, all that is in the world, the world passeth away. You get a sense of John's meaning here. If no other point is conveyed, don't be too attached to this world because it's passing away. Don't be too attached to this world because it's passing away. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Let's take these three verses a statement at a time. First of all, love not the world. Well, as we've already alluded to today, does this mean that we are to hate the creation itself? How many of you enjoy hiking? You know, one of the beautiful things about hiking is to get out in the middle of nowhere and look at things, right? And hopefully our cell signal doesn't work there, so you can't get phone calls and you're not tempted to hike up and down trails, scrolling on social media and arguing with strangers in the comment sections and all the things that people do as a hobby on social media. You get out into nature and you behold the beauty of it. Now, there are many commentators and preachers who have taken this to mean not to love this physical world that we're in because it is ruined by sin. But I want us to remember that this is still God's creation. God made it at the beginning of time. When God made it at the beginning of time, not only did He say it was good, but He said it was very good. What did we do with that creation? Well, we marred it with sin. We polluted it. We corrupted it with sin. Because of that, it is fallen. It is ruined. It is worthy to be judged. It is cursed. And because of that curse, it brings forth certain things to us. Thorns, thistles. We, rather than eating of the good of the earth, as Adam would have done, we, we till the ground by the sweat of our face to make our livings and have our provision. That's why work is difficult, unless you do something that you absolutely love, and even then there are difficult days. I was talking with some folks from our church this week about the blessing of being a pastor and a radio host and a videographer for Christian content and a trumpet player, and a trumpet teacher. I really love what I do. It's awesome what I get to do. But even as a pastor or a player, there there are days when churches go through difficulties. There are days when you have to pray with someone on their deathbed. There are moments when you're a player, when your lips just do not want to work, and you go for the note and the note doesn't play and you play a wrong note and everybody looks at you like what's wrong with that guy i've been there more times than i can count including this week and it will happen this next week and it will happen the next week even if you have the privilege of doing exactly what you want to do there are still days when work is not a very pleasant thing it's hard because we live in a cursed world marred by sin corrupted. But it's still the world that God made. And so, in my mind, I parallel it with us being made after the image of God. Are we still in the upright image of God that we were created in? No, because we did what? What did Adam do? He sinned, violated the law of God. And then when he had children, according to Genesis 5, his children were made in whose image? Adam's image. But at the same time, the New Testament tells us that we are to treat one another as human beings with dignity and respect because we're made in the image of God. I see this world in a similar light. No, it's not what it used to be, but it is still the creation of God. It is still something that is beautiful and to be appreciated, we are to subdue it but we are also to be good stewards of it. It is to be something that we look at, and as we 
investigate this world, as we observe this world, it glorifies God because it is it is his handiwork. David wrote that the heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showeth his handiwork. I'm not to look at the night sky and think, I hate these stars. I don't love them. Well, no. That declares God's glory. Should I hate something that declares God's glory? I think that John has something very specific in mind that he will share with us in verse 16. What he means by this world. I don't believe that he means that creation is to be despised. Rather, I believe that what John has under consideration here is the sin and the evil of this world. I shouldn't love the sin or the evil of this world. Now, you and I can get a good glimpse of that and the proper sentiment we should have for that when we see something terrible happen to someone. If a person is murdered in cold blood, rather than just merely being indifferent to it or not loving it, we should hate that that has happened. We should hate that. The word hate is one that we need to be careful with because... Let me explain why. Hatred is an emotion that God experiences. God hated Esau. But God's hatred, unlike ours, is not guided by carnality. A lot of times we hate things because of our carnality. God's hatred is righteous. It is pure. <clears throat> God hates with a, a righteous indignation. David would say that he hates those that God hates. The Old Testament says God hates all the workers of iniquity. Divine hatred is a thing in the Bible. Well, when I look out and see someone murdered in cold blood, I should hate that that happened. I should hate it. It should make me absolutely sick that it occurred. But do you realize that God views a bunch of paganistic, hedonistic people partying all night during Mardi Gras, doing all kinds of wicked, lascivious things. God hates that sin just as much as the sin of murder. There's no passage in the Bible that says God hates murder more than X, Y, Z. And a lot of the times those things go together because you very rarely have a society that is given to extreme sexual perversion without the other types of grievous sins coming into existence in that culture. Romans 1 is a good example of that. Love not the world. I believe what John is telling us here is to despise the sin of this world as much as God despises the sin of this world. And so we hate that those things take place. More on that in a moment. Verse 15, love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. From this passage, I want to consider two other things. First of all, what does the Bible, how the Bible uses this word world in other places? And then lastly, the love of the Father is not in him. That's a very strong statement, and as we'll see throughout this book, John often paints in strong statements and opposites and broad brushes, as it were. Yeah, there are nuances here that we could dig a little deeper in other scriptures about, but as a general principle, he shares that with us. This next point to consider, John's usage of the word world to describe things. The word here is cosmos in Greek. That comes into the English language as a root of the word cosmology, cosmological. I believe my college astronomy book was entitled The Cosmos. 
we spell it in English with a C, it would be spelled in Greek with a K. But this word here is used in a much more broad way than we use it today in English. This word cosmos simply means a created order, a created order. It can refer to, in the Bible, the universe, according as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the what, in Ephesians 1-4? The world, which God promised before the world began, Titus chapter 1. What's He talking about there with world? He's talking about the physical creation, not just this planet, but everything. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and all of it is referred to as the world, the cosmos. We understand that thinking about the Greek word because to us, cosmos means everything but this planet. If you say we're peering into the cosmos, you know exactly what's being said. By the way, I'm having to keep myself very subdued because if I get animated, I'm going to lose my voice. So y'all have to pay attention to me today and keep yourself awake without me getting animated because if I talk loud, my voice is going to go away. And then I will be whispering the sermon to you. And then you will be more inclined to fall asleep. He whispers sweet peace to me. This word cosmos, world, means created order. It can refer to the universe. It can refer to the planet itself, planet Earth, the world. We use it that way most of the time. Sometimes it's plural. God created the worlds in Hebrews. It can refer to a body of people. The whole world went out to see John the Baptist. Do you think Native Americans went out to see John the Baptist? That had reference to all the people around that region at that time. The whole world was to be taxed. Did Native Americans get taxed? Native Americans didn't get taxed. That sounds like something America would do, right? We found life on Mars. Let's try to tax them. Thanks. We really appreciate it. In John's writings, he uses it in about four different ways. First of all, John uses it with reference to creation. And I'm going to give you some of these examples today. The first is in the book of John, the Gospel John, chapter 1 and verse 9. Christ is the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. What do you think that usage of the word world has reference to? Has reference to the planet, creation, or existence. They come into being, and He lights them. He lights every man that cometh into the world. In John chapter 3, in verse 16, possibly the most famous verse that Christians know today, For God so loved the world. This is a world that is the recipient of His love. Was Esau a part of that world? God hated Esau, so no, Esau wasn't a part of that world. But there's a world that God loved, and He gave His only begotten Son for them. How do you know who was a part of this world? Well, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God sent His Son not to condemn this world, but that the world through Him might be saved. This is the world of the saved. John uses the word world that way. Remember, a created order, a group, a large group of people. John 17, verse 9, give you the context here. Jesus is praying to His Father before going to the cross. He has delivered a message that began at the end, began at the end of John chapter 13 after He washed the disciples' feet. He continues this message until He goes out into the garden And as Jesus prays, He's often referring to His disciples. He prays for them. He prays for those who would believe because of their testimony, which includes you and me even here today. But notice what John says in verse 9 of John 17. I pray for them. I pray not for the world. I pray for your people, and remember, in chapter 17, 
In verse 2, we read that Jesus has been given power over all flesh to give eternal life to as many as God the Father has given him. And here, Jesus prays for those God the Father had given him, but not for the world. This is obviously a different world than the world in John 3.16. Because the world in John 3.16 is beloved. The world in John 3.16 will not come into condemnation. The world in John 17.9, Jesus doesn't pray for. The world in John 17.9 stands in contrast with those that God has given him who belong to God. I pray for them. I pray not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me, for they are thine. The significance of John 3.16, by the way, God so loved the world, not just Jews, but people out of every nation, kindred, and tongue that were given to Christ by the Father to save. I pray for them that you've given me. I pray not for the world. That's obviously speaking of two different worlds. The word world is a very common one in John's writings, by the way. It was a word that was, a, was often a part of his vocabulary. And maybe it's a good time to bring out the fact that the Holy Spirit inspired what we're reading today. But as the Holy Spirit used John to write what we're reading today, the Holy Spirit used John to write what we're reading today, to write what we're reading today, okay? This means the Holy Spirit uses John's life experience. The Holy Spirit uses John's vocabulary. The Holy Spirit uses John's writing style. The Holy Spirit uses the phrases that John was more inclined to use. To quote my brother Josh, it's his birthday today. He's 39, his last year before his odometer rolls over on the front. If y'all want to get on social media and say, Happy birthday, Josh. Your brother said you were now old. I would love it. And, and you could make little remarks like, We thought you were older than him. You look so much older. You look so sad and stressed and worn out and aged. You've got so much more gray hair than him, and your hairline is receding beyond his. And You've got much more health issues than he has. Certainly, we thought you were at least 50 by now. Please get, on, please get online and say that to him. Actually, just cut this snippet out. This would be a snippet for the YouTube channel. We'll make this a snippet. It'll go viral. Josh said years ago that while the Holy Spirit inspires the Scriptures to be written, the man's life the man himself, the man's vocabulary might be the color of the ink that God used when he wrote what he wrote in Scripture. And I don't know if that's original to him or if he read it in a commentary somewhere, but that is a good way to think about how these various men had their writing styles and how the Holy Spirit used that as these books of the Bible were written. John often uses the word world to refer to great groups of people in their entirety whether it be the cosmos, the planet, God's people, known by their belief, the wicked for whom he does not pray. And I would point out from John 1.10, who do not receive him. How do we know that? Well, John 1.10. Here, I believe that the word world has reference to the evil and the sin that permeates this place, to love not the world. I'm going to pause here for just a moment and make some observations. It's hard for you and for me to fully not love this world. Now, you might get mad at a murder that you hear about on the news at night, but while we might be inclined to be upset at such injustices, we might revel in, you know, scrolling through YouTube and they, they show us somebody get hurt and we, we snicker at it. We might be inclined, I've got one buddy that loves to watch fight videos. Do you think God's pleased when two grown men get in each other's face and start punching each other in the face? 
I don't think, I don't think God approves of that. And yet when we see it online, what are we like, oh, look at that. I don't think God's pleased with that, so why am I watching it for entertainment? It really doesn't, it really doesn't matter who we are. There's something in this world that is going to catch our eye and draw our affection and our attention in. We like to think about the big things like, you know, somebody hurting another person. Or maybe the sins that we don't struggle with, we'll get really upset about those. But there are sins that you and I struggle with every day, and we're not to love that either. We're not to indulge in that either. We're to mortify the lust of our flesh, remembering that this world is temporary and that we belong to the Lord. If any man love the world, love not the world. Now, considering the love of the Father, I want to consider two senses from this passage. In a practical sense, and this is to you, if you and I are loving the sin of this world in that moment, we're not loving God the Father. Now, where might I get that thought from in the Bible? Jesus said, you cannot love God and mammon. Now, what does it mean to love mammon? Well, certainly mammon has to be some old first century big deity with horns like a bull made out of granite. And he's like 12, 15 foot tall. And it was something people would go and bow around like a totem pole and dance around it in a loincloth. Right? That's mammon, right? Some false god that doesn't affect me. You know what mammon means? Money. I cannot love God and money. Now, wait a minute, preacher. Wait a minute. You cannot serve two masters, Jesus says. You will either love one and hate the other or love one and despise the other. And interestingly enough, the word that he uses is something that was not confined to the first century. What if Jesus says you cannot love God and Zeus? Like, whoo, I don't have a problem with that one. I've never been inclined to worship Zeus. How about you cannot love God and the wickedness that took place in the Roman Colosseum? Well, I don't have a problem with that either because I've never been to the Roman Colosseum. He uses an example that affects every single one of us even today. Money. And the love of money is what? The root of all sorts of evil, all evil. All in Scripture usually means all of a certain type or some of all types. And the root of all evil there, the root of all sorts of evil that's experienced in the world. The love of money is the root of all evil. Jesus says you can't love God and money. What is probably the greatest idol of America today? It's money. It's hands down money. We vote because of it. We work because of it. We get mad at people because of it. We get envious of people because of it. Our politics is ran by it. The love of money. You cannot love God and money. And so, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him because I cannot serve two masters at one time. If I am loving the things of this world, I'm not loving the Father at that moment. Now, that's for you and for me. What's another sense of this text? In the ultimate sense, if a person just absolutely loves every sinful thing in existence with no sort of guilt or shame or loathing, it speaks ill about his spiritual state. What might that communicate? If he loves the fornication, if he loves the murder, if he loves the abuse. You know there are people out there that when they see someone hurt by another person, they're not sad about it. When they lie, they don't feel guilty. When they steal, they don't feel guilty. When they punch some innocent person in the face, they don't feel guilty. What does that say about that person's spiritual state if they feel no contrition over their sins at all? They are unregenerate. 
they are yet unregenerate. And the love of the Father is not in them. You see, at the new birth, something is written on your hearts by the very finger of God. What is that? What's written on our hearts at the new birth? The law of God. If the law of God is written on your heart, the seed of human emotion, then when you do that which is contrary to that law that is now written on the core of your being, something in you feels bad. Don't you try to numb that? Haven't you tried to numb that at times in your past? Like, I don't like that feeling. Let me go distract myself so I don't have to think about that feeling. Rather than just saying, Lord, I've done something wrong. Please help me confess it, find strength and healing. When an unregenerate sins, listen to me, there is zero contrition. There might be regret that they got caught. They might be sad at the consequences of their actions. Some of them aren't even upset about that. I've told this story to you before, but when I was in college, I worked at a state park in the maintenance department, and one of my duties at times was to take a carload of inmates, a truckload of inmates around to each facility and to supervise them cleaning and cutting grass, weed eating, emptying the trash, that sort of thing. Well, I weighed a, a total of 115 pounds. I was 17, then 18. Not really the person you want to put in charge of a bunch of inmates because these aren't like misdemeanor inmates. A couple of them were there for murder. Some of them were there for drugs. This guy, over lunch one day, said, when I get out of prison, I'm going to go sell me a bunch of drugs. I'm going to buy me an Impala. I'm going to put big wheels on it. And I'm going to roll around with loudspeakers through the neighborhood with a blunt in my mouth, you know. And I said, aren't you afraid of going back to jail? He was like, man, all they can take from me is time. I'm like, well, yeah, that's the one thing you don't get back. I mean, like, that would bother me, the thought of having to be in jail for a prolonged period of time. But he had zero contrition for what he had done. Now, I knew people who were incarcerated, and I've shared this with you too, usually coupled with this story. There was an inmate there, a good man. We worked together cutting grass for, for a good eight months before he got out of prison he drove drunk one night, got into a wreck, it killed a woman. He spent 12 years in prison because of that. And he regretted what he had done. What was the difference in those two men? Well, the presence of the Holy Spirit in their heart. That man would smuggle shirts in and out of prison where he'd written on them with a marker, Jesus is my Lord. And he would wear them to tell the other inmates what he was all about. Because I don't know if you realize this or not, but prisons are terrible places. They're, they're not nice places to be. People are always like, oh man, you get to be in air conditioning and work out all the time and watch TV and every meal's provided for you. And some federal prisons are that way. Dad worked for one in Talladega. My, my Uncle Steve was nearly killed in a riot at that prison, by the way. But... You take all the criminals who got caught and put them in one place, and you tell me what you think that's going to be like. And this man wore a shirt, Jesus is my Lord. Snuck it in and out of the prison. He had contrition. There was a difference in his heart. In the ultimate sense, if a person just absolutely loves the world with zero regret, zero contrition, zero internal struggle, zero loathing, zero guilt, zero shame. What is that telling you about the person? The love of the Father is not in that person because they are yet without the laws of God written on their heart. They're not born again. Getting to the crux of John's intent, verse 16, let's read it. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. For all that is in the world. Now, if I had written that or translated that into English, I would be tempted to put maybe a colon there to explain what I was meaning. The punctuation is not in the original language, by the way. In fact, it's all uppercase Greek in the earliest manuscripts with 
with nigh a space between the word, and it's very difficult to read in the earliest manuscripts that we have recovered. All that is in the world. What is John speaking about here? Is he telling you, if you go to the Grand Canyon, I want you to look at that in disdain. If you ever see the Grand Canyon, you're probably struck with a sense of awe. You ever seen it? It is really something to take in. It is literally breathtaking, and I know that word's overused, but it really is breathtaking. I saw several parts at it. Micah was in the car, and I napped at the big breathtaking part with Micah in the car, and I get scolded for that at least once a month. All the way out there in Arizona, and you don't even go look at the big part that everybody goes to look at. Sorry. Or how about when you go up to Sequoia and you see those trees? It was a set for Star Wars Episode Six. All them giant trees that they're on those speeders around, those weren't fake. They literally go up and took that. Or they literally went up and, and filmed that among the redwoods and the sequoias. There, there are trees that are as big around as half of this building. And they grow only in that part of the world. And some of the older trees there, 3,500 years old, they were trees when David was alive. That's something to think about, isn't it? Am I to walk up the mountain to Sequoia and think, I hate these trees? No. When I'm told love not the world, the primary focus John has here, he defines in verse 16. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, this is not of the Father, but it is of the world. He defines what he means as the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Now, some have speculated that all sinful choices that we have to make in this world, every time we choose to sin, it comes from one or more of these three sources in our lives. And I believe that that is true. Even the original sin of Adam was committed in accord with these motivations. Now let me be very clear that there was not sin in the world until the forbidden fruit touched the mouth of Adam and he ate. Because by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin. But there was intent and motivation before that. How might even the original sin of Adam have been committed in accord with these motivations? Well, let's look at Genesis chapter 3. The serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. He said unto the woman, Yea, if God said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden. He questions God's word. The woman says unto the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the tree, of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, Ye shall not eat of it, neither shall ye touch it, lest ye die. And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and ye shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. And when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desired to make one wise. She took of the fruit thereof and did eat, and gave also to her husband with her, and he did eat. And their eyes were both open, and they knew they were naked. They made fig leaves, aprons out of fig leaves, and hid themselves from God. The lust of the flesh, what might the flesh have to do with that. Well, when we say flesh, we mean our carnal nature, but what is your flesh, your physical being? They were hungry. They were hungry. That's your flesh. Your flesh gets hungry. It wasn't sinful yet. How about the eyes? It was good to look at the lust of the eyes. And the what? The pride of life. What does Satan promise them? In the day you eat thereof, you will be what? As God. What is it? Exaltation of self. It is pride. What did Satan promise them? Self-exaltation. Now, to be very clear, again, sin did not exist yet. So, while you can see shadings of this there in the book of Genesis, even in the original sin, 
Sin didn't come into existence until that first bite was taken, but we know through James that sin begins with the desire that conceives and brings forth sin. Lust conceives sin in our heart, and sin, when it is finished, does what? It brings forth death. That's the pattern of Genesis chapter 3. They desired to do that which was wrong. They acted on that desire, and it led to the downfall of our entire race. So from that, we see that the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life stem from Adam's transgression because it was the original sin. And as children of Adam, by nature, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, it's a part of all of us. I could give you a series of on this passage, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life about Bible characters all through the Old and the New Testament, how this affected them. The most notable example would probably be that of King David as he was laying on his bed at noon, not what Scripture says we need to do unless we're sick or we're hurt. David's laying on his bed at noon. He arises, and instead of being out to war, when kings go to war, he sent his military commander, Joab. David looks, and he sees a woman bathing named Bathsheba, and she was beautiful. And he lusted after her in his flesh. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and the pride of life were all there in David's sin. That's why I said one or more of these calls us to sin. That is the root of generally every sinful decision that you and I will ever make. Verse 17, and the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. First of all, the world passes away. Both the sin of this world and the creation itself is going to pass away. Sin will be judged. The world will be destroyed. And as believers, this ought to shift our focus to things more enduring and cause us to hold all that is down here with a loose grip. Now you're thinking, that's right. But in November, you might not think that's right. Loose grip. But Brother Ben, this is the single most important election in the history of my life. That's what they said in 2020 and 2016 and 2012 and 2008 and 2004, and 2000. Loose grip. Because God is not up for re-election. Tangent. How about another one? What starts up next week full-time? Oh, Lord, he's done God on that subject. Oh, here we come. What starts next week? Football. Football. Please do not throw your drink at your TV because the man in your color didn't run the pigskin up and down the field as well as the man in the other color. It don't matter. It does not matter. In the history of the universe, when it's all said and done, if the roll tides or the war eagles aren't victorious, it's okay. There's not a chapter in the history book in school about it. It really is not that important. Yeah, but you remember that 10 years ago they, they did that kick six thing. No, it doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. But Bear Brunt, no, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter. It's not worth your emotional investment to that degree. Y'all still happy with me? That's why I quit watching most football games. Because I felt my heart rate going up. My blood pressure going up. My anxiety going, and I'm thinking, why am I getting this emotionally invested about this? I'll watch games for teams I don't like just because it's on TV and I don't have to worry about it. Let me tell you, if it's not something that is eternal, then you and I need to hold it with a loose grip. I was convicted by this in college, and I've shared this story with you before, too, but it's relevant, and I think it fits. I was huge into cars. It was so important to me. I had a project car or two, 
through the years. Still something that I enjoy, but not like, not like then. I got out of church one Sunday and drove home, listened to the NASCAR race on the way home, as I would do. If you ever dr- drove Highway 25 between Leeds and Starrett, you know that there are two Double Oak Mountain, two mountains you have to cross that are curvy. And I'd have that NASCAR race cranked up, and I'm, I'm driving a Ford Taurus because that's what the NASCAR drivers drove, and it's not a NASCAR. It was not fast. It was slow, and it didn't handle good. And I'm just rocketing through those curves, I mean, week in and week out. I go over to my uncle's shop where we sat around working on cars, looking at cars, and he, he was such a good body shop guy. He was even featured at one point in one of his cars that he did in Motor Trend magazine. That's how big of a deal he was car-wise. I pull into the shop, and this overwhelming thought hit me. Nothing that you are doing here today matters. It has no bearing on eternity. It's not connected with anything eternal. It is a waste of your time. I'm going to tell you what. I was like, wait a minute. What? Do, do I think what I'm doing here today is going to change your eternal destiny? No, only Jesus can do that. So that didn't even really make sense with my theology at the time, but... We are to lay up for ourselves treasures where? In heaven. That's what was being experienced by my soul. That was one of the most impactful moments in my adult life. Because it was after that that I fully went after the ministry and changed everything that we experienced in our family from that moment forward. Is what I'm doing connected with things that are eternal? If not, what sort of a grip do I need to hold them with? A loose grip. doesn't mean they don't matter. Some things don't. But it doesn't mean that they don't matter. It matters that you have a job. It matters what's going on at work. It matters if you're dealing with a health crisis. It matters if you're dealing with children issues in your home. That matters! But there's a lot of things that we get so emotionally invested in in this world, and we need to remember that that will burn at the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you want to take your family out on a nice day instead of mowing the crabgrass, by all means. The crabgrass will be there tomorrow, and one day it'll be burnt up anyway. Peter would say in 2 Peter chapter 2, Nevertheless, we look for new heavens and a new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness. Think about this. The Christian's hope is the opposite of humanity in general. Rather than looking for utopia in this world, what is the Christian looking for? The end of this world. A better world. Built upon better promises. Where we are rescued to and we will be forever. And then the last statement here. He that doeth the will of God abideth forever. And that is a statement of sweet assurance to you that you will abide forever with Christ. Two takeaways from today's message. When you are confronted with a choice, what I want you to ask yourself is, am I being motivated by the lust of my flesh, the lust of my eyes, or the pride of my life? And if the answer to any of those three questions is yes, then that is a thing that I do not need to do. Then number two, when I am confronted with an, op- uh, an emotional investment Ask yourself, do I believe in Christ? Well, yes, I believe in Christ. Does this matter in the grand scheme of things? Well, maybe not. Do I anticipate being with Him in glory? Yeah, I do. Would Scripture have me display this level of emotion, whether anxiety or anger, about what I'm experiencing right now? If the answer to that is no, then set your affections on things above, where moth and rust do not corrupt. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for this passage that we considered today. Help us not to love this world. And we know, Lord, that the physical creation declares your glory and glorifies you. You made it, and it was very good when you made it. We know that we tainted it with sin. We corrupted it. We polluted it. But, Lord, it glorifies you, and because of that, I... I don't suppose that we should despise the physical creation, but the sin that is in the world, Lord, we are not to love. Help us, Father, to be aware of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Help us to make decisions motivated 
for the right reasons. Help us to serve you with a pure heart. Help us to be faithful to your calls. Help us, Lord, to keep in mind that everything down here is temporal, temporary. It passes away, and because of that, we don't say, let us eat and drink and be merry, for tomorrow we die. For we have a hope and glory where we will be raised incorruptible. Nevertheless, Lord, we look for this new heavens and new earth wherein dwelleth righteousness in the final day of the Lord when your Son returns and rescues us to be with you forever. Help us to keep that heavenly perspective in mind, worrying only with our daily bread, knowing that our keeper is above, and even in death we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Forgive us, Lord, of our many sins. We pray together in Jesus' name, and we say, Amen. Praise God from whom all blessings.